Physics students, good afternoon. Mr. Fugue here. In our video today, we're going to be looking at group problem 9a, which will take some of the concepts we've covered in class over momentum and use them to solve a multi-step problem. If you'd like a copy of the problem itself, uh, make sure to check Canvas in the Unit 9 page. There is a copy of the problem as well as a key. I'm not going to have the problem statement up here, so we have plenty of room to work through each part of the problem, but if you would like a copy of the problem, make sure to check on Canvas in that page. So here we will be looking at group problem 9a and talking through how to apply what we've learned with momentum to analyze what happens during the collision. Uh, so here we're told a little bit about a collision. We've got uh, what we refer to as a blue car and a red car. The objects do collide. And what we will be trying to find here is using the information about what happens after the collision to work back to figure out what happened before the collision. So I will read us the problem statement just so we have a little bit of context and then we'll jump in. So here we go. A blue car has rear-ended a red car that was stopped at a red light. The two cars have stuck together and slid together some distance into the intersection. Luckily, right after the collision, the motors of the red car hit the brakes and there is now a skid mark that runs from the point of the collision to where the car stopped. Uh, we are told the mass of the cars, the red car is about 2,000 kilograms, and the blue car is about 2,500 kilograms. We also know that the coefficient of the, uh, excuse me, coefficient of friction between the red car's tires and the road is about 0.9. And we're told the skid mark is about 6.5 meters long. Here, we're told that the uh, speed limit on the road is about 25 miles an hour, or 11.2 meters per second. And we want to use the information about the collision to determine if the blue car uh, gets a ticket for speed. So here, uh, just to get a little bit of a visual, we've got a blue car, just going to represent it as a dot key thing symbol, that is moving, and we're told the mass of the blue car is 2,000, excuse me, 2,500 kilograms. However, we do not know what the initial velocity of the blue car is. I would assume it would be positive because I'm drawing it to the right, but hey, we don't know what that actual number is. And then we've got our red car here with a mass of 2,500, nope, 2,000. Got those numbers flipped. And we're told the red car is initially stopped at a red light. Uh, so we're told here uh, to write some equations. Now that we have a picture going, this is kind of part A. Part B wants us to write an equation for the total momentum before the collision and the total momentum after the collision. So in part B, here's what we would do. The momentum prior to the collision, or initial momentum, a P sub I, really is going to focus on the blue car. Because the red car is not going to have any momentum because it's stopped. So I would write momentum initially would be the momentum of the blue car, mass multiplied by its velocity, plus the momentum of the red car, mass multiplied by velocity. Now, I can probably go ahead and cancel this out to zero because the velocity of the red car is zero since it stopped at the light. And then after the collision, <coughs> excuse me, momentum final, well, we are told that the cars they collide and stick together. So what that means is that we can take the masses of both objects, A and B, my apologies, blue and red, mass of blue and mass of red, and add those together. Because the objects are stuck together after the collision, they're probably going to have the same velocity. So really, we can treat them as if they're one object with one final velocity. So these would be uh, equations that would show what's going on with the momentum prior to the collision and what's going on with the momentum after the collision. Now, we're not told about any significant external forces during the collision. Remember, the cars will collide and apply a force on each other. That's something that we would call an internal force, something inside the system. But we're not told about any significant outside or external forces eh, during the collision. Part C does say this. Eh? After the collision occurs, the cars do come to a stop, right? We're told that the red car hits its brakes and the cars are going to come to a stop. We were also told a little bit of information about a coefficient of friction, which means that there is some type of force of friction slowing the cars down after the collision. Now, again, that is a scenario after the cars collide and stick together. Once they start to hit their brakes and move forward into the intersection, 
that's a scenario in which there is a significant outside force. Something that does not involve both cars, but that is an outside force acting on the system, causing a change in momentum. Right? Clearly the cars are slowing down, so there is a change in momentum there due to this significant external force. Now part D of the group problem wants us to, uh, looks like, draw a free body diagram and apply Newton's second law to find the force of friction. So let's do that. Now, assuming, based on the picture we have, that the blue car was moving to the right, after the collision occurs, well, we would have a force of gravity acting on the cars, or car individually. Uh, we would have a normal force, assuming the cars are in contact with the road. And again, likely that those forces will be equal because we're not told anything about acceleration vertically, but we'll look at that here in a moment. And then assuming that the cars were moving to the right, the force of friction would be working to the left to slow the cars down. Now we're told we want to find the force of friction here. F sub k is equal to our coefficient, mu sub k, multiplied by the normal force. Now we're told in the problem statement what the coefficient of friction is, 0.9, but we need to find the normal force. Now we're told that only the red car hits its brakes. So typically the force of friction is only acting on the red car. So if we want to find the normal force on the red car, again, we can't really add the masses here because the cars really aren't stacked on each other, right? They're side by side. Right, so when we're looking at the forces on the red car, we can't really add the mass of the blue car. The cars aren't stacked together. So to find the normal force on the red car, here's what we can do. Using Newton's second law, sum of forces in the y direction is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration in the y direction. So I've got Fn, I would refer to that as a positive force because it's directed upward, plus a negative Fg, I would call Fg negative because of its direction, is equal to zero. The reason why I would set this equal to zero is because our car, or cars in this situation after the collision, are not accelerating vertically. And we're told the ground is level, so we can assume that they're just a sliding forward horizontally. So our acceleration zero multiplied by the mass would give us zero. So then I can add the force of gravity over and show that the normal force on the red car is equal to the force of gravity on the red car. And we know that to find the force of gravity, we take the mass of our object multiplied by acceleration due to gravity. The red car's mass was 20, 2,000, 2,500, I'm getting those numbers mixed up. 2,000 kilograms for the red car. So we'd go 2,000 multiplied by 9.81 meters per second squared. So here we go. 2,000, 9.81, we get about 1,000, excuse me, 19,620. That would be our normal force, which we're now going to use to find our force of friction. So I'll bring that value, 19,620, and I'm going to bring that up here to find our force of friction. So here we go, force of friction, F sub K, is equal to our coefficient, 0.9, multiplied by 19,620, Newtons. So our force of friction on the red car would be, plug this in, 17,658 Newtons. So really this part here is kind of drawing us back to what we covered previously in the year. Okay? Using what we know about forces and Newton's laws to analyze what's going on with the forces on the car. So now that we have our force of friction, uh, the problem now uh, wants us to find the acceleration of the cars together. So, kind of moving on, we want to find what's going on in the x direction. So here, this is part, I believe, E, yes. We're going to look at the sum of forces in the x direction and set that equal to the mass of our objects multiplied by their acceleration. So here, the only force we really have is our force of friction, right? Look back at our free body diagram. Only force in the x direction was our force of friction, and it was to the left, which means I'm going to refer to that as a negative force because of its direction. According to our coordinate system, left is negative x. Is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration. I'll just leave those values in here for now. So our force of friction was 17,658, I believe. 
Double check that. 17658, good. Now the mass, which mass do we use? Well, the problem tells us to use the mass of the two car wreck. Here's why. A moment ago, we only used the mass of the red car because in the vertical direction, well, really the red car was one object by itself. We couldn't really treat them as two objects in the y direction because they're not stacked on top of each other. But if we're looking at things in the x direction, right, we can kind of treat those objects as if they're one object, both cars together. So we'll use the total mass, 2,000 and 2,500, to get 4,500 kilograms, multiplied by our acceleration in the x, whatever that is. And you can see here, algebraically, the solve for acceleration, we now just divide by the mass. So divide by 4,500 kilograms. Divide by 4,500 kilograms. These values will now cancel out. And to find my acceleration in the x, I take negative 17,658 divided by 4,500. I get right about 3.92. Oh, sorry, that looks like the page adjusted there. Come on, there we go. Acceleration in the x is negative 3.92. And remember, negative here is telling us about the direction. The cars are going to the right, which is the positive x, but they're slowing down, which means they have a negative acceleration. So negative 3.92 meters per second squared. Good. Now, remember, that's not really telling us what's going, uh, what our final answers are. We want to know about the velocities. So now, we're going to take that number, and we're going to look at what happens after the collision. This is kind of a challenging scenario because we have what's going on before the collision, the collision itself, and then what happens after the collision. So part F is really wanting us to find what's going on after the collision. So this is part F now. And we want to find the velocity of the cars right after they collide. So here's what we know. We know that the cars, after they collide, slide a distance of 6.5 meters. We don't know what the velocity of the cars would be right after they collide. Let's call that the initial velocity after the collision. We do know that after the cars slide the 6.5 meters, they're at rest, and we just found the acceleration to be negative 3.92 meters per second squared. And time is something we don't know here. Now, as we know about kinematics, we really only need three variables. <laughs> time is something that we don't know, and we're not really asked about time. So if we find our equation that doesn't have time, I believe that's equation 5, which looks like this. V1 squared is equal to V0 squared plus 2A delta x. So now let's take our variables and we'll plug them into this equation over here. I might see if I can adjust this over a little bit. There we go. Okay, so final velocity would be 0. So 0 squared is equal to, well, the initial velocity squared. Remember, that's the initial velocity after the collision. Plus 2 multiplied by the acceleration, negative 3.92. Multiplied by delta x, 6.5. I know it's getting a little smaller over there, my apologies. I'm going to leave the units off for now just so that we can save a little space. So let's multiply this chunk together. 2 multiplied by negative 3.92 multiplied by 6.5. We get about negative 50.96. So I've got 0 is equal to the initial velocity squared minus 50.96. So again, we want to know what that initial velocity is, so we'll add over 50.96 to both sides of our equation, and we'll get something like v0 squared is equal to 50.96, and as you can probably see now, we just take the square root of 50.96 and see what we get. 96 square root, about 7.13 meters per second. Now, technically, when we take the square root, we would get a positive and a negative as the resulting answers. But here, we would likely use the positive value because the cars collided and moved to the right based on the picture we drew. So now we know the velocity of the cars right after they collide. This would be a shared velocity. So the problem next tells us to come all the way back to the momentum equations we wrote at the beginning. So all the way back up 
here. Now we just found the velocity, but we have to think contextually, what is that velocity? Was that the velocity of the blue car before the collision? Well, no, because we were looking at what happened after the collision there. Was it the velocity of the red car before the collision? Well, no, because the red car was stuck. We're already told that. The only other possible velocity we have would be V final. Which sounds weird because we just found an initial velocity. But remember, initial and final are all really relative to the points in time that we're choosing. Here, initial means prior to the collision, final means after. Down here, initial velocity was right after the collision, final means once the cars have come to a stop. So this V0 is actually the combined velocity of the cars right after the collision. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take our final momentum equation and plug in the values that we now know. The mass of our two cars, 2,000 kilograms and 2,500 kilograms, multiplied by their combined velocity, 7.13 meters per second. So 2,000 and 2,500 gives us 4,500 multiplied by 7.13. We get a final momentum of approximately 32,085 kilogram meters per second. Now assuming that there are no significant external forces, which we're not told that there are here, we can assume that our initial momentum would be the same as our final. But remember, before the collision, all the momentum in the system was with the blue car. The red car was stopped. So now, here's what we can do. Initial momentum is really mass of the blue car multiplied by the velocity of the blue car because remember the red car was stopped. So I'm going to take this number here, plug it in. We know the total momentum, 32,085 kilogram meters per second, is equal to the mass of the blue car, which was, I believe, 2,500. Finally remember one of those, good. Kilograms multiplied by the initial velocity of the blue car. Lastly, I would just need to divide by the mass on both sides of my equation. 2,500 divided by 2,500. And I would get 32,085 divided by 2,500. We get about 12.83. Now that's going to tell me the velocity of the blue car prior to the collision. We were told the speed limit was about 11.2 meters per second. So now we have evidence to show that the driver of the blue car would get a ticket because they were speeding prior to the collision. So here we're taking the concepts that we've learned about momentum and conservation, as well as integrating some older concepts that we covered related to forces and Newton's laws of motion. Remember, as we talked about in class, things like forces, kinematics, energy, those are really fundamental concepts that we're not just going to learn about and put on the shelf. There are things that are always going to influence how we approach solving problems. So hopefully this gets us going in the right direction on group problem 9A. As always, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask, and remember to check Canvas for other resources. Good luck.